and you are here watching SCW, the wrestling channel here on YouTube.com. It is time for SCW Rewind once again. Hi, my name is Steve. I'm joined by George, and we're going to be discussing a Monday Night Show WCW action once again, going all the way back to the mid-90s. We've got the final two weeks before Halloween Havoc to touch, and we may just even touch on the pay-per-view as well. Um, George, how are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you for having me again on your show. I'm looking forward to discussing a, a great month in WCW yet again. Absolutely. We've got uh, a lot of lot to go through on this particular episode. Of course, I would say we've got those big feuds heading into Halloween Havoc. We've got, of course, Hollywood, or not even Hollywood at this point, it's Hulk Hogan in the black. We've got a Yeti, um, and we've got so much more wackiness to go through. We've got some great technical wrestling to talk about as well. So uh, without further ado, should we get into the first show? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Well, we're going to go all the way back then to 16th of October in 1995. And uh, WCW, of course, is episode seven uh, of Nitro at this point. And uh, a very, very noteworthy episode. So much here to talk about on this particular one. Um, we start off on the show, actually, with a, a throwback to WCW Pro uh, because there's a talk with the main event. Of course, Ric Flair was looking for a partner from the previous week. He had managed to find one in Sting, which, of course... It's a surprise to many. Ric Flair was see being a heel, uh, Sting being the biggest babyface or one of the biggest babyfaces in pro wrestling at this point. And um, yeah, we see that Ric Flair obviously makes the uh, from the footage that makes the ask to Sting whether he'll be the tag partner. Uh, Sting uh, warns though that if he is screwed by Ric Flair, that he will leave him for dead. So it looks like that the acceptance is there, and we have the tag team main event for Nitro, of course, which will be Ric Flair and Sting against. Double A, Arn Anderson and Brian Pillman. Um, I thought this was a, a good way to start the show, especially with the fact that um, we got the footage looking back here. Um, so we had the recap of factor here to, to, to know if people only watch Nitro, that they could see what happened over the weekend. Yeah, I think it was a very good way to start. Clearly, you're putting that answer out there so that anybody that hasn't seen WCW Pro knows that Ric Flair is going to have a partner because clearly the cliffhanger they left it last week was that Ric Flair didn't have a partner. He was obviously continued to get double teamed by Arn Anderson and Brian Pillman. And the fact you've got Stin and Ric Flair, that's an interesting dynamic, particularly going back to the early days of WCW back in the 90s. Ric Flair and Stin had quite a lot of matches and were synonymous with feuds, including the Black Scorpion when Ric Flair was Black Scorpion and stuff. So it was interesting. It's great to see Ric Flair and Stin as a team. Though. I'm excited by that team. Absolutely. And in fact, they were even opponents on the first night show. So it just goes to show what can change in a short time as well. So I uh, know very interesting indeed. And uh, of course, we'll be talking about that main event later on in this episode. Uh, but we kick off as well with um, the television championship match, actually. They the, the set this for Halloween Havoc, but they we're going to do it early on Nitro. Uh, Diamond Dallas Page with the Diamond Doll going to be defending his television championship against Johnny B. Bad. Um, there was footage as well from the uh, Saturday night where um, DDP had uh, shown that he was the reason that Johnny B. Bad didn't get a United States championship match. Um, apparently uh, all the tyres were flats on Johnny B. Bad's car um, and uh, what well, he's I think an associate in the background uh, gave away uh, of how many tyres were done and Johnny Rivad was like how do you know how many tyres were done uh, and which led him to the, the left hook to DDP um, I thought this was a fun throwback it's a good way to set the match up between these two uh, what were your thoughts with this video package yeah, I thought it was okay. I thought it uh, did what it did. It gave history to the feud. Um, it's interesting the fact that they're facing each other when they're set to face each other at the pay-per-view. Um, a couple of key things about this match. I don't know if you're aware, Steve. The reason why the match went so quickly, uh, Johnny V. Bad was legitimately injured. He had a rib injury going into this match, which I don't really? know if that's clear, um, which is why they did it so quick. But um, it, this basically gave a nice taste of the match we was going to see at Halloween Havoc, which... If, you, if anyone has seen that, that match was far longer. It went 17 minutes at Halloween Havoc, but um, this did what it needed to do. And it was a great cameo by Max Muscle there, obviously giving away that he let down the tyres, which I felt was quite clever, and keep the storyline going. Absolutely. And you say here, I mean, we got a very, very quick uh, fit. I mean, the match didn't really get started, did it? Didn't he be attacking Johnny Uvad as he comes to the ring from behind, hitting him with the championship belt? Um, so we see Johnny Bad on the ground. DDP goes to give him a cover, one, two, three, and actually also uses um, Johnny Bad sort of, uh, he has like a, a gun which shoots out the confetti, uh, and he uses that to shoot into the crowd as well. Uh, the Diamond Doll, you can clearly see there's friction between him and the Diamond Doll. She's sort of mortified by his actions. Um, this just clearly is an angle, really, just to set up for, for the pay per view. And um, yeah, I mean, I think this was a job well done. Yeah, definitely. You don't want to give away the full sort of story and outcome when you've got a pay-per-view many weeks, not many weeks away, if that makes sense. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And we then move on. And of course, if you're wanting some action on Nitro, what a great match to give us in its place here for the next match. Eddie Guerrero against Chris Benoit. Um, these two got a bit of time as well, which was great to see. Um, no cutaways to the back like the last time we saw of Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko. This was given the full uh, treatment and it felt like a technical masterclass. What were your thoughts? Yeah, fantastic match. Uh, this did what it needed to do. Clearly, this was a level up from what we'd seen previously on the night so far. Um, but this was really good. I liked it. A couple of key things that were, were great. Eddie Guerrero got some brand new music. I don't know if you noticed that, Steve. I thought that was quite good. Um, yes. I really like the way the commentators were referring to Benoit as the Canadian Crippler. It made him seem like he was a bit like an international superstar. And I really like the way that the commentators put both wrestlers over. So both wrestlers clearly weren't connecting with the crowd at that point still, which kind of made it hard, but some of the some of the moves and some of the matches, some of the moments in this match just were, this was excellent, really. I felt that, I particularly like the ending, though, with the dragon suplex. I thought that was really kind of good. But the only thing that kind of disheartened me about it was how little the crowd responded, which um, it's just a shame, really, when, when you look at the quality of wrestling both these two wrestlers put on, really. It just goes to show how time really sort of, you know, of the essence now. We look at both of these guys and think they're two of the best technical wrestlers of all time. Um, you know, Eddie Guerrero still gets a chance to this day. And it just it just goes to show that, um, you know, what they have as a legacy. But um, when it comes to in-ring, anyway, we're going to talk about today. Uh, but to, to go into this match here, like you say, at this point, perhaps it's more than the name value people go for. Um, but um, no, a fantastic match between these two. Like you say there, Eddie Guerrero missing the, the, the frog splash, Eddie Chris Benoit getting the, the knees up. Um, we see the power bomb that Chris Benoit gave to Eddie Guerrero, his, his actual... The back of his head actually hits the canvas. It's devastating. And like you say, then with that sort of uh, dragon suplex for the win there, that sort of Fall Nelson into a German there. And uh, it's just technically brilliant. I absolutely really enjoyed this match. What was interesting as well was that afterwards, the commentators, Eric Bischoff, uh, actually announced that uh, they were expecting a cruiserweight division to be coming to WCW soon. Uh, this really excited me. Definitely. I think it's refreshing. Bear in mind, we've never really seen that at that point. You hadn't had the WF light heavyweight title. And the fact that they were getting these cruiserweight wrestlers in, it just meant that I think in sort of 95, we'd never seen that on a mainstream promotion. You could say ECW to a certain point, but ECW at that point wasn't a, a, a national promotion, I'd say. So, um, yeah, very, very exciting. Something different, certainly to the bigger wrestlers they've got in WCW. Another key thing I would say about this match, which, uh, which I thought was quite clever, they're painting Chris Benoit as a heel here early on, which I think is, is a really good way to introduce him to the crowd that didn't know him as such. Absolutely, because if you are supposed to get behind someone that uh, you don't know and you're not reacting to, then uh, sometimes that can be a, a little bit bland and sometimes it's easier to play the bad guy role because you're not expecting the big reactions at that point. You can, you know, get yourself where you're disliked and people are more likely to react to you if they're meant to dislike you. So, yeah, I think that's a good shout indeed. And um, like you say, I mean, the light heavyweight title was probably the closest we had to the, the cruiserweight division before. <laughs> Um, I, I remember, of course, we had that with the early 90s as well in WCW, but of course didn't really have the, the longevity. And of course, now we've got a, a main weekly live television broadcast. Um, this is certainly is something that we're going to look forward to and can stick our teeth into because with the quality of these wrestlers, um, it's definitely uh, going to be some highlights of the evening, I'm pretty sure. And we know, uh, obviously going through history and because we're so many years later, so many of the great talent that went to join the uh, WCW Cruiserweight division. So uh, certainly going to be an exciting segment of the show at some point that we'll get to cover uh, is the WCW Cruiserweight division. Uh, but next we will actually go to Mean Gene Oakland in the ring and um, oh, don't we just love the WCW line every week. Um, uh, we have to have a quick mention on it. Uh, the things that were on the hotline this week that you could actually call but can't discuss on air was a top official from WWF was released over the weekend. He is history and there was a superstar fighting with a fan in the parking lot and actually didn't come off better. Find out who on the WCW hotline. Now, of course, it's 25 years later, so we can't call that number. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, just throwing in digs at Vince McMahon wherever they can, can't they, WCW? I've got it for you, Steve. I'll put it out there to you now. This is putting you on the spot. Um, who do you reckon the superstar was that was actually um, sort of fighting in the parking lot? Let's see if you can guess, and I'll tell you who it was if you don't know. If my memory serves me right, now, this is a guess, complete guess here, but I have this vague memory that I feel that Shawn Michaels was that guy. Yeah, very good. And it, it wasn't just uh, sort of Shawn Michaels fighting in, fighting with one fan. It was a time that Shawn Michaels, unfortunately, was attacked by the people from the army in the car park in Syracuse. Oh, it, yes. it was that, that time that they're talking about. So clearly the way that WCW are making it seem so derisory, it's, it's just a massive pot shot, isn't it, at that point? Mm, absolutely. Very good, very good on the guest, though. Well done. You got it right. So I'm impressed. 
I, it, to be honest, it's a lucky guess. So I had to, you know, uh, I remember at the time listening again, what was that? And I thought myself, the only one I can remember is, is uh, Shawn Michaels back in the day. And uh, yeah, it's good that, good that it was on the money. Uh, I don't remember the top WWF official, though. Yeah, I, I wouldn't like to take a punt. No, I, it, it depends. The only thing I can say, actually, there is one person I would say if I was going to punt at that time, uh, would be Bill Watts. I know Bill Watts at that point was, was fired from WWF and he was quite high up in the company. Obviously, he had a tumultuous time in WCW previously, and he went to WF with like sort of ideas from the 70s and 80s that obviously didn't unfortunately work. So I, I would guess Bill Watts at that time would fit. Yeah, that could be, a, could be a strong shout then, especially with the history, like you say, that with WCW previously, that would give them uh, all the uh, ammo they would need to put that on the hotline. So that would be a good shout if that was the case. Uh, but we go to the, the actual task in hand then for me, Gene, and uh, we mentioned task in hand, the Taskmaster and uh, the, the giant here uh, were in the ring here, at this, obviously hyping up Halloween Havoc. And uh, what I really like about this, we said about four brawl uh, on the lead up to that, not so much build for that pay-per-view here. So much mention of Halloween Havoc. So big props to WCW for that. They are really building towards the pay-per-view. Um, the Taskmaster though, of course, we're talking about Hulk Hogan in the black. Um, he says, of course, to Kevin Sullivan that he's evil. Um, um, and there's, of course, Hulk Hogan is now evil after wearing the black last week. There's still some small bit of goodness left in him, but um, you have to remember that Hulk Hogan has given up his colours, and um, the giant then promises to defeat Hogan at Halloween Havoc uh, with the monster trucks, and of course then with the in-ring action as well. Um, I thought that this was a um, very good build towards the pay-per-view. I enjoyed it. Anything with Kevin Sullivan this time as a taskmaster is electric, um, but this was really, really good. And you're putting your main match out there for Halloween Havoc out sort of in the focal point of Nitro, which is clever, I think. I think it was um, really well done. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, yeah, like we say at this point, uh, it was a bit bonkers with Kevin Sullivan, but um, like you say, it, it's something that you just have to love. Um, it certainly is a, a, a bit up the wall. And uh, yeah, for its time, I think it was very good. Um, we will go on to something else that's a bit off the wall um, coming up for us next then, uh, but definitely one of my favourite portions of the show. Uh, Disco Inferno with that Disco Fever. He's always got them dance moves at the ready, dancing in the entrance way. Uh, he's never scheduled to be there. I think this is the third week now in the row that he's done this, but um, yeah, he wasn't there very long. He runs away very quickly this week. Doesn't doesn't argue with anyone as soon as Ming's music hits. It is Ming versus Hacksaw Jim Duggan. And um, we do get a question, though, which I thought was nicely put here. Um, where is the Taskmaster? Uh, he's not with Ming during this uh, this match here, uh, which is uh, very interesting. And both of them have a very short match. Hacksaw looks like he's going to get the uh, be on top here. He hits, hits one of his clotheslines. Uh, but Ming doesn't sell it at all. Gets straight up. We see like a super kick almost uh, to the throat. And then we see, uh, you know, the spike has been used a lot by Ming recently. Uh, but he uses this into the side of Duncan's throat and actually wins with a submission victory. Um, for me, I didn't have much interest. Bit of a throwaway. Even less interest. The Taskmaster is not there. It deems that it's not important enough for him to give his time to it. So why should he give ours? Yeah, well said. I think this match was a throwaway. Uh, clearly, Min had to win. Obviously, Min's going to have a match with Lex Luger at Halloween Havoc. So you're building up Min still. Min obviously beat Lex Luger previously on Nitro, so he's keeping up that win streak. Um, and I just thought this match was really, really boring. Um, what amazed me was how much the crowd were into it with Duggan. I just couldn't believe how over Hacksaw Jim Duggan still was at that point, which is um, it's just WCW. It says it all, really, doesn't it? Absolutely. And you know, like we say earlier in the in the show there, the likes of the the young bucks, if you want, of Chris Benoit and, and Eddie Guerrero putting on an absolute masterclass, but yet this match perhaps a little bit messy, not not as technically nowhere near really as technically good at all. I mean Hacksaw's a brawler to begin with. Um but yet the fans were all over this one in comparison to the two matches. Just it goes to show the sign of the times and the, the big name value in, in superstars at that point. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well we shall move on then and uh, we've got Hulk Hogan backstage. Um, it seems to have his his, uh, like his name behind him, dressed in the black. Still got the neck brace with Jimmy Hart, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read a little bit for you because Hogan goes on quite a bit during this and a lot of good stuff in here. Um, he says that the the the, the, the evil within Hulk Hogan is real, and the Taskmaster's words are true. Um, but now it's time to take care of family business here to protect the prayers and vitamins. Um, the giant doesn't realise that he can make a um, uh, sorry, the, the, yeah, the giant doesn't realise that, that Hogan can make a promoter drop to his knees uh, as he, Hogan is more powerful than that entire promotion. So I want to stop that actually right there because it's a clear dig once again at the World Wrestling Federation here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, all, all shots are being fired on this Nitro again. 
Is there any particular reason, because this is the second week Hogan uh, in particular is the guy doing it, is it because of the fact of the name value of Hogan, or do you think that there's something deep within here of why Hogan's doing this? It's got to be the name value. I think those to be looked at is anything that Hulk Hogan touched would help boost the ratings. Um, so that's the only thing I can think, but definitely it's all Hogan. Hogan's the main vessel at the moment. And I think they also want to make Hogan seem a bit more edgy because his gimmick at that point had been a bit stale. I 100% agree. he been doing the same gimmick for, well, uh, you know, well over 10 years, hadn't he? So, uh, yeah, it was definitely time to spice things up a little bit. And they did do that here. Um, but we go back to, to the words of Hogan. He says that uh, slamming his father, of course, they did the gimmick of where the giant's father was Andre the Giant at that point, uh, would be nothing in comparison to what he's going to do to him. Um, Jimmy Hart actually interrupts and says that he's worried for Hulk Hogan, and Hogan tells him to stay out of this. Um, he is going to beat him. And he's going to bury the giant next to his father. Um, another very edgy line. Would you say that's a bit near or perhaps over the line? I think it's on the money. You think it's on the money? Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Okay, cool. Um, what were your thoughts with Jimmy Hart being worried? Interesting. I think it plants very interesting seeds to what's to come. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I just, for me, feel to myself looking at it at that particular point that um, it really builds and sells for the giant here. And it kind of almost feels that for the first time that um, in WCW, we usually always see Hogan as the favourite. Um, and doesn't matter who he's going to face, Hogan can overcome, um, which is obviously no surprise when you're taking them the likes of like the Butcher and people like that going through the year. But here, literally, um, there is a fear factor with this giant that he could be the one, it feels. And um, yeah, like you say, a lot, a lot of seeds planted for, for what is to come later down the line. Um, is there anything you'd like to touch on with, with the Hogan? I think it's very interesting at this point how clearly WCW and the Hogan camp is such a tease in a Hulk Hogan heel turn to come. Um, and the way you're getting Hulk Hogan being so sort of uh, so so much wearing dark colours and stuff like that. It's quite interesting. A lot of discussion at that point around the industry during this time period was that Hulk Hogan potentially could gone up, could have gone on to join the Four Horsemen, which would have been crazy if it had happened. But um, this is really interesting. I think what kind of uh, I found a bit stupid in this promo was the fact that you got Hulk Hogan dressed in like an evil side, yet he's going on about sort of Hulkamaniacs and eating vitamins, Sam prayers and stuff, which is just um, it looked like he couldn't decide what, he, what what sort of gimmick he wanted to do during this promo a bit. Yeah, he was a little bit all over the place. He almost felt like that um, he's really sort of struggling between that good yeah. and evil yeah. side. Okay. So. Good way of putting it, yeah. Yeah, but uh, no, very very interesting stuff indeed. And certainly, I think this really does build towards that pay-per-view. Uh, th this match has certainly got a lot of time, a lot of investment. And um, I must admit, at this point, I I'm interested in seeing what happens between the two of these, particularly as well as we've not seen the giant in the ring at this point. Um, we've got then the main event, then, which was Double uh, A, Arn Anderson and Brian Pillman against Ric Flair and Sting. Uh, but it's no Sting at the start of this match, which is very interesting. It starts as a two-on-one encounter. But Ric Flair seems to hold his own for the majority of this match if we're being brutally honest. Um, but um, there is a point where the heels do get the upper hand uh, and we see Sting actually come down to uh, to the ringside area. Um, the hot tag is made, obviously. The fans go crazy. Uh, we see Sting obviously make the save here. Close lines, double A over the top rope. He throws Brian Pillman from the top turnbuckle uh, where basically uh, he's sort of stranded on the top rope there. Obviously the legs in between. It was a, a painful looking uh, manoeuvre when I see that and uh, Pillman goes to the floor and actually both of the guys don't come back in and we see a victory for the faces by count out. Uh, what were your thoughts with this match? I thought this was interestingly put together. Yeah, it was. A, it was. A, it did what it needed to do for a main event. I think it was a good rehearsal for the pay per view. Uh, clearly, obviously, we're going to have the same match again, sort of at Halloween Havoc. But um, no, I enjoyed it. I thought. I thought it was good. Uh, I like the way that sort of the crowd were invested. The only thing I thought about it was I thought the ending was a bit rushed, and I think sort of they seemed to lose heat with the crowd a bit. I think the crowd sort of was a bit was w well into it. And the fact that it ended and, and the finish came from nowhere, it was almost like WWE ran out of time here. Yeah. Yeah, or perhaps it was a curse here that uh, the show was so short at this point because um, obviously we know in later times Night Show becomes double, even triple the length. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's certainly interesting how that point made that. I think it's a very good point. It feels that that, that finish was rushed. And we do see that obviously there's a stare between Ric Flair and Sting after the match and both celebrate like their baby faces. It feels that like Ric Flair here is a full-on baby face. It's clever, very clever. I really like what they did. And what I also like about this match is the fact you're not getting anybody get pinned. And once again, although you're not sort of going towards sort of a, a clear finish, I mean, you're making people want to see the rematch at the pay-per-view. Absolutely. If you get the clear finish, 
match. What's the need for the rematch? There is no need at all. Um, but we do see, obviously, Mean Gene. He's a busy guy, Mean Gene. Gets back in the ring here uh, with Sting and Flair. Tag match at Halloween Havoc, of course, like you say, announced there. Uh, and Sting says that he, he thought that... Uh, no one thought I could trust you, he says. Um, I was sat in the back watching, and uh, you've got lots of guts and showing heart. I know that you were shooting straight with the stinger. Uh, they both have a high five. Uh, the commentators, interestingly, though, um, don't seem as sold on it, which is very interesting as well. There's always seeds of doubt planted straight away into this. Um, what are your feelings uh, with this uh, here? Do you think it's just brilliantly put together? Are you sold on Ric Flair being a face? Or have you got the element of doubt knowing that the, the commentators aren't so convinced themselves? If I put myself back into sort of looking at the age I was when I watched it, um, before today, obviously, um, I think um, you generally would have thought Rip Flair is a baby face now, based on the fact that Rip Flair's constantly been attacked by Brian Pillman and Ar Arn Anderson. You've been waiting many weeks now for Rip Flair to get his revenge on Arn Anderson, so I really went with it. I really sort of took it hook, line and sinker that Rip Flair and Stin are going to be a good tandem going into this tag team match at Halloween Havoc 95. I must admit, I'm the same as well here because, like you say, Ric Flair has gone through weeks and weeks of problems with Arn Anderson and Brian Pillman. He needs to get his revenge. He needs a partner. Who better than Sting? And, uh, yeah, it, it seems like it's going to work pretty well. Um, but so just to give one great line, just to finish off here, because this is almost the finishing line of the episode here. They go to the commentators. And Bobby Heenan, he's always great, isn't he, with these little one-liners being cups up with them. He says, a slap on the back is only 12 inches away from a kick in the butt. <laughs> uh, I thought that was a great way to, to finish off there with Night Show. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think this was a solid show, all in all. And like we say, maybe the uh, the, the Hacksaw Jim Duggan me match was a bit disappointing. But great build for Hogan and uh, the Giant. We've got great build here for, uh, you know, the tag team match we just talked about. DDP and Johnny B. Bad. I mean, it's, I believe the first time DDP was actually on Night Show at this point. And, uh, I mean, we had a great match as well between Benoit and Eddie Guerrero. So, I mean, all in all, I was very satisfied with this. I really enjoyed it. It really created the further interest to have to go out and see Halloween Havoc, which is ideal really at this point. Absolutely, absolutely. But um, we're going to touch on something just something we haven't done so far. I believe you've got the ratings of what this show did at that particular time, George. Okay, so WCW Nitro for this show, they got a rating of 2.2. This was compared to Monday Night's Raw for the same show, obviously, got a 2.6. And the headliner for Monday Night Raw was Bret Hart versus Isaac Yankum in a cage match. So what do you wow. make that Bret Hart and Isaac Yankum in a cage drew more than uh, Stin and Ric Flair in the main event? Well, I mean, obviously, for name value, uh, for this point, you would imagine, obviously, Ric Flair um, and Sting, both bigger names than, than uh, Isaac Yankum, for sure. Uh, Bret Hart, of course, at that point, had been champion or had been on and off in the main event area for, for a good couple of years at this point. Their feud on WWF, uh, I do remember, had been going from... Uh, the first match was at SummerSlam between these two. So clearly this had probably was being a payoff area as well with the cage match. So it's very interesting. It just goes to show at this point that Nitro are making some noise. They're catching up, but they're not quite there yet at taking over WWF at that point. But um, certainly interesting. I suppose it's better than having your uh, the, the competitors having a match, I don't know, for example, as a throwaway, the Body Donners against the Godwins or something. At least that wasn't the main event. But um, certainly um, it, it does go to show that WCW here are in they're in the ballpark. They're only a point four behind the World Wrestling Federation at this point. So surely that's going to that's gonna build and get greater as we know as we go along. Yeah, definitely. I think the fact after having years and years of being behind, the fact that WCW are getting quite close, it just shows that um, the fact that WWF are willing to throw a cage match out on just the Monday Night Raw shows how much of a threat they saw WCW at that point. Absolutely, indeed. Absolutely. Um, should we move on to episode eight, or is there anything more you'd like to talk about with episode seven? No, no, seven? let's move on to episode eight. Definitely. Well, it's the following week. It is the Go Home Show before Halloween Havoc, and it is on the 23rd of October 1995, episode eight, as we like to call it, of Monday Nitro. Um, we've got a match to kick off. We're going straight into the action this week. No mucking around. The macho man, Randy Savage. Oh, yeah. Going to be taking on uh, Kurosawa. Sorry, I had to get the impression in there. Uh, Kurosawa, of course, with Colonel Robert Parker. Uh, for those not familiar with Kurosawa, he'd been around for a, a few months. He'd had a, a program with Hawk. Uh, the Road Warrior Hawk, of course, and put him out with, uh, you know, you know, really taken out his arm. The interesting part with this match, Savage actually had a bandage on his left arm. So it kind of built in here for the character and, and uh, the work here for Kurosawa to, to look strong in this match. Um, but um, ultimately, it didn't pay off for him. Um, we did see Randy Savage picking up the victory. And, uh, of course, he needed the win going into Halloween Havoc, of course, was due to take on Kamala. 
uh, I believe, at that point. Um, and Savage, of course, winning with the elbow from the top rope. Um, I thought this was, uh, was OK for an opening match here on uh, Nitro. And uh, Kurosawa uh, certainly um, perhaps could have done with, with, with not losing clean here. But at the same time, it's all about putting your main event talent over. Yeah, definitely. I think this was a really, really kind of horrible match. I think this match almost was as horrible as the one that happened the night before in WF where Maple faced Yokozuna in your house. I think this match was contender for match one of the worst matches of the year, unfortunately. this um, For an opening match in Nitro, it did what it needed to do. Um, I wasn't a fan of putting Karasara in there. I think you're trying to build him to go into a Halloween Havoc match. But um, I get why Savage won. Savage is far more an asset than Karasara. But um, this did what it needed to do. I just felt this was a mismatch of styles. And it didn't really connect for me personally. No, to be honest, I, I, I don't know if I'd go as far as bad as, as Mabel versus Yokozuna. But um, certainly um, I, I would agree that the chemistry wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, I, I did expect a bit more from these two, I must admit. But uh, they were given quite a bit of time as well. Um, I believe that it even went an ad break between these two. I have got kind of one last thing about this. What kind of frustrated me as well is the fact that both of these two wrestlers have got matches at Halloween Havoc, yet they don't have any sort of outside interference, e.g. from Kamala or from Hawk or something. You would have thought that there'd be something to further build up their matches that are going to happen at Halloween Havoc. Absolutely. In fact, one actually thing we've not spoke about at all in this episode, which was really building on the last time we did one of these, was the Savage Lex Luger stuff. And um, there seems to be nothing here uh, since that was a potentially made either. Do you think that that's a bit of a loophole that we've sort of almost forgotten about Lex Luger? He's not been mentioned here at all so far. Very well spotted. I um, I missed that. So that's very, very well spotted. I think um, they've almost painted that the picture that you're going to get that payoff for that answer at Halloween Havoc. It's, that is almost secondary now, isn't it? So, yeah, it feels so. It feels so. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, we will move on in the meantime anyway. And uh, Eric Bischoff, what I liked about this then, really building your main event once again for, or not not for the night of Halloween Havoc, like you say, Hogan, the Giant and the Dungeon of the Doom are all in the building. And this week, there is no restraining order. Um, I thought that that was good because it, it clearly gives you that feeling we're going to see these guys collide at some point this evening. Uh, what's the appetite? Does it not? Definitely, the fact you're going to get these big stars or the most, some of the most over people in WWE, and you might get that eventual payoff to what you're going to see at Halloween Havoc early. You're going to stay tuned, aren't you, based on that? Absolutely. Now, um, George, for me, this next segment, answers were on a postcard. I didn't have a clue what the hell was being said here. So, I mean, if you, when we go to the Dungeon of Doom segment here, um, is there anything you can light on this? Because, to be honest, it just felt like a struggle to listen to this. Um, so let, let, let's break it down as best as we can. So you've obviously got uh, Curtis Ikea, Prince Curtis. He was a legend in wrestling back in the 80s. Um, he's obviously made various cameos in, in WCW as the master and stuff like that. But um, the trouble of this, for me, it's disconnected less than an Asuka promo currently. I just felt it was, um, there was odd bits of English in it. I get that he's meant to be sort of demonic, etc., etc. Um It just was a bit of a, this was ultimately wrestle crap. This, this was comedy gold. I felt... Um, it wouldn't be out of place kind of probably in the dark order or something like that nowadays. I think it's just, um, it was up there certainly with um, one of the strangest things I've ever seen. Absolutely. Absolutely. What I could take from this, like we say, uh, absolute bonkers from whatever the hell he was saying. But what we do get is that there was this, this sort of mysterious iceberg on the stage um, area, which, which seems to be pointing here towards, you know, what uh, whatever he was going on about. We thankfully got Mean Gene Oakland uh, with the Taskmaster and the Giant to make some sense of what the hell was going on. Like you say, wrestle crap number, like really is best here. And uh, the Taskmaster uh, says that this is the insurance policy, the Yeti, uh, which I, I'm looking forward to talking about properly uh, with you at some stage. Um, the Giant says that, Hogan, you're running out of lives there is only one true immortal giant. Um, and of course, the Taskmaster solidifies it, saying that the World Championship will be coming to the giant. Um, I thought that this was good. It kind of rescued the, the, the segment for me. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I must admit, I did have a giggle during this whole thing. This just truly goes to show the Dungeon of Doom as being an absolute bonkers stable is what it is. Yeah, the fact they're so high up the card and you're getting this. Uh, the, the thing that rescued the promo for me was the minute Kevin Sullivan started talking again, you got some sense out of him, even though there's a lot of nonsense that's gone on before. An interesting point of fact that you may not have been aware of is uh, the original reason why they struggled to do this angle to a certain point was they struggled to get the original person, the Giant Gonzalez, who was meant to be under the Yeti costume, he struggled to get a visa, so they put in Ron Reese in this spot, which was quite interesting. But um, you're further creating odds against Hulk Hogan as well, which is interesting. But... Um, this was um, entertaining, to say the least. It was a bit of a strange segment. 
It certainly was indeed. And uh, you do wonder how we were going to get in a response from it. And we didn't have to wait long for a response from this. We had some adverts and we come back. And then uh, me, Gene, is on the entrance corner at Hogan and Jimmy Hart. So we got an instant reaction here. And, and uh, it's almost, you know, almost one of it was a bit too close that these two had their segments with each other without any altercation. But um, I shall suspend my disbelief anyway in the meantime. And um, Hogan, of course, is still in the black. He's still in the neck brace. Hogan fears no evil. He fears no man. He carries all Hulkamaniacs. Uh, and he says that he might even keep the black gloves and black bandana after Halloween Havoc because you know what that means he can do. Uh, we can come to that part in a minute. Uh, he says that he's not going to lick his wounds anymore. And he actually takes the neck brace off. Um, and then we even see Mean Gene ask about Sting, Lex Luger, and the Macho Man. Hogan goes, yeah, my so-called friends. Uh, clearly, none of them have been there to support him as of late. Uh, better all get in line. Who has the biggest bark? The big dog is waiting. Interesting wording. We'll come on to that and touch that in shortly. Hogan says he will beat all one at a time. So a lot to digest here in just a few short minutes here. Uh, first off, Hogan still dressed in the black, but not licking his wounds. The neck brace is off. It suggests Hogan is 100% going into Halloween Havoc. Yeah, uh, that's, that's interesting. I'm surprised they did that. I would have thought they'd keep the whole Hulk Hogan's necks injured to, to create the underdog story. Yeah, you would have thought so, definitely. I mean, do you think it's because of the fact that they have monster trucks, which is still sounds bizarre for me to say here, um, as, as the opening thing that they'll be doing at Halloween Havoc, that perhaps they feel that he needed to have that reveal there rather than at the match? Yeah, I guess that makes sense. I think the fact if you're going to put Hulk Hogan risking it all with, with almost like a supposed broken neck in the monster truck, it probably wouldn't make sense. So that, that's probably a really good point you made there. Uh, it's, it's only a guesstimate here. I mean, you, you, there's no, no, no telling what they're thinking when you've got the Dungeon of Doom running around in WCW. What, what, what's going through their minds at this point? Um, but um, what are your thoughts with the keeping the black gloves and the uh, bandana? Is this the edgy stuff that you're referring to? That this is why I'm suggesting he might keep this going. I certainly think it's edgy. There's a couple of key points that are interesting. The fact that Hulk Hogan and his and his team are thinking about a serious hill turn. This is teasing a hill turn for later in 96, clearly. Um, this was really, really eye-opening at that point. Um, and the fact that if you look at Hulk Hogan's last pay-per-view, which was Fall Brawl, for once he didn't have any sort of impact on the ratings. It was a really low rating. So people are starting to get sick of Hulk Hogan as based on what happened at the Chicago Nitro where he was booed out of the arena. Um it's just it's just so different to see Hulk Hogan in this guise. And the fact that they're creating Hulk Hogan with this attitude, it makes you really wonder whether he's going to be heel. You don't know in, as you go into Halloween Havoc what the outcome is or whether he's going to turn or whether he's sort of going in, he's going to ever go back to being the um, yellow and red as such. Yeah, absolutely. It's great points you make there. And, and even there, actually, where he's almost challenging on the biggest baby faces outside of him in the company, that surely uh, in, implies there could be a heel turn down the line as well. Yeah, definitely. The fact that you're putting him in there and he's throwing the baby faces under the bus to a certain to say, um, I think it's just refreshing. It's, it just really shows how much damage the Giants done. And same with the Taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan, to further make you make question whether Hulk Hogan is actually losing his mind. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was a, a very well put together promo, this. And um, yeah, very, very good indeed. Very interested to see where this is going to lead to when we get to Halloween Havoc itself. Um, we get to one last thing. Sorry, Steve. Absolutely, uh, go for it. One last thing on that one. Uh, the fans in, in the attendance really took it as well. We didn't get booed this week, which was really good. Yeah, interesting. And we were at Alabama as well, so uh, I'm not sure what the market was, was like for that. So uh, interesting that uh, Hogan wasn't booed this week, uh, particularly, obviously, like I said, he'd taken a bit of a pounding from fans with, with boos in, in previous weeks. Uh, but we had a tag team match next, and uh, obviously your technical masterclass of the evening, Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko against Eddie Guerrero and JL. It was supposed to be Alex Wright, but Alex Wright wasn't cleared. Uh, he'd injured his knee. He had crutches coming down to the ring, was was supporting with the baby faces. Um, we saw that I thought was a, a decent tag team match between these two um, these two teams we see uh, all four in the ring at one point uh, Eddie Graham and Chris Benoit take each other out of the ring uh, both going over the top rope um, we see that Dean Malenko hits the ropes and he's tripped by Alex Wright with one of the crutches uh, JL climbs on the shoulders and does a forward roll up for the one two three uh, first pinfall victory for JL um, we see that uh a bit of cheating from the face is interesting. Uh, and uh, I think this is just to make everybody happy overall with, with giving those baby faces the victory. 
Yeah, definitely. A couple of key things in this match. Um, the fact that JL got a win, he's obviously building up momentum going into his Halloween Havoc match against Sabu. That made sense to me. Um, yeah. I really like the way that they're building up this whole Cruiserweight title. Bischoff once again mentioning it. And this match was really, really good. I felt um, it told a really good story. And I really enjoyed the fact that they're putting sort of Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko together. Both of them, they've also got a match sort of on the pre-show to Halloween Havoc. So it made sense. Uh, my only criticism really of this match was the fact that you had a, a cutaway throwaway uh, backstage where you've got Scott Norton and Shark, when, um, to be fair, I just thought it just sort of was totally unnecessary. It totally took away from the ring again, which which sort of kind of watered it down. Um, but but this was okay. I thought it I thought it um, kind of did what it did. This definitely was one of the best parts of the show so far. Absolutely. You want people to take this product seriously um, with, with these cruiserweights, but yet they keep cutting away from some of their matches. Uh, we mentioned, obviously, it happened in episode five, which I believe was Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko. And um, you think to yourself, well, I mean, is there any interest in Scott Norton and the Shark for you? Or could this have been done after the match? This is a WCW Pro, WCW Saturday Night type match. It's, 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 this isn't a match that shouldn't be. If you look at the fact that you're not putting sort of um, the Shark or Scott Norton on Halloween Havoc, they're not going to be in the ring, so I don't really get why they did this. But um, this did what it needed to do. I think uh, it created sort of it created a buzz about the Cruiserweight division to a certain point. But I really wish that WCW sort of stopped taking away from in, in ring, if that makes sense. I think the only problem you've got is you're making these four wrestlers in the ring look like jobbers a bit by sort of not keeping their matches in full context, if that makes sense. If you're continually cutting it away from it. Um, and also, you've also got like sort of other stuff as well. It just goes on. I think it, I, th- I thought it was okay. I thought it did what it needed to do. I really like the way that Guerrero got a massive pop as well, like when, when he finally got that tag from JL. But um, this was good. I really want to see these four wrestle again, if possible. Absolutely, I would like to see that as well. Interesting point after the match as well. Obviously, the celebrations, Eddie Guerrero goes down the entranceway, gets attacked by Brian Pillman, DDT, um, on the uh, entranceway. Um, for me, it come a bit out of, out of the blue, this. Um, I didn't see this coming, but just goes to show that this loose cannon gimmick is uh, really taking off for Brian Pillman. It was random, that's for sure. It certainly was. Um, hopefully, we get more of a fallout on it as we go further on, because um, I don't believe that uh, there was a match with these two at Halloween Havoc either, was there? No, there wasn't. There was not. So, yeah, it, it, interesting. wonder where this will build to. And we go there next, um, and we've got our main event coming up, Sting and Lex Luger. Finally, we can mention about Luger this week. He's been very quiet for the last two weeks against the Harlem Heat with Sensational Sherry. Um, what's interesting, of course, another WWF World Wrestling Federation bash has to be done, doesn't it, by WCW? Bashing in your house the night before uh, and saying something as well about eventually the walls coming down. Uh, I thought it was a good little line that was put in there as well with the in your house tag. Um, I wondered your thoughts on this with, with the In Your House uh, dig that they had from the pay-per-view the night before. They're very, very witty, aren't they? They are indeed, yeah. They, they, don't, put, they don't hold back. They, don't, they pull their punches where they need to. Um, but um, we, we go to um, the match. And I thought very interesting thing before we start here. Sting is dressed in the red and yellow. He's in Hogan colours. Uh, it just goes to show this full baby face feeling. Um, what, what's your thoughts on that? I think it's kind of just shows that Aunt Marie Stin's a good guy by that by that sort of dressing. Um and I thought it was um interesting. It was certainly different different attire for Stin at that point. Absolutely. Of course attacking with Lex Luger as well, where people are on the fence and unsure with as well. He just goes to put the question of make sure you cheer Sting because Sting is a good guy, Sting's not gone bad. It kind of it, it was almost um telling a story that those colours were definitely done on purpose. It wasn't as if like he was dressed in black and white, for example, or or just some random colours that you usually see with Sting. I thought it was a very well, nice, observated kind of thing that WWE has given us here. Yeah, definitely. Um, what were your thoughts of Harlem Heat uh, at this point? Because obviously Harlem Heat had been in WCW since 1993. Um, they're sort of, you know, tag team division, but playing a bit part to this role. But they've got themselves here where they're in the main event of Monday Nitro. Um, the first time they're in the main event of Monday Nitro as well. And um, I think that uh, they're obviously seeing as a real credit at this at this point to be taking on a team like Sting and Lex Luger. Definitely. Uh, a couple of key interesting points. Um, actually, what had already been filmed by that point that wasn't actually released. Um, Harlem Heat actually were tag team champions, but it wasn't common knowledge at that point. So... Um, I, I think that's the kind of reason why they're in this main event spot. Um, but it was interesting. The fact you're getting the Stin and Lex Luger tandem going back to the 90s, they were they had a mass, fantastic feud. Um, but what a step up for Harlem Heat, though. I think um, it was interesting just to see these four be in a main event spot, if that makes sense, against sort of with Luger and Stin teaming. Absolutely indeed. Well, we're going to the match itself. 
and um, obviously they, they've been given a little bit of time here, which was was which was quite good. Um, but um, always impresses me when I see him. Uh, looks even more painful when it's missed. Uh, a somersault uh, leg drop by Booker T off the top rope missed on Luger. Uh, and which leads to us getting the hot tag for Sting to come in. Um, Sting obviously cleans house here, but there is a point where he goes outside of the ring uh, and Harlem Heat are actually double teaming on Luger again. Seem to lose focus that Sting is the one that's actually uh, the legal man in the ring. See a double suplex. Uh, Stevie Ray continues on Luger. Booker turns around, a flying clothesline from the top rope, and Sting picks up the victory. Um, he, I think it's what was needed. We needed to put the faces over here. Yeah, definitely. I think the fact that you can't have sort of uh, you can't have Harlem Heat go over here. No way. No, not at all. Uh, but um, that's only the beginning to what leads to the chaos. We see, obviously, the Taskmaster and, and the Giant come down to the ring. And uh, probably the most interesting thing, of course, of all, was that uh, Luger not had been hit and miss whether he was a part of the uh, the target of the Taskmaster and the Giant. Oh, was he choke slammed here? He was the first target here this time. Uh, Luger choke slammed, so you thought definitely Luger babyface here at this point. It's made it clear that Luger is nothing to do with the Dungeon of the Doom here at this point. Sting comes in, he's choke slammed as well. Um, and we see Savage come down to the ring. Hogan come down to the ring. Um, at this point, Savage looks like he's going to be involved, but leaves Hogan to it. Um, Hogan looks to try and hit the Giant a couple of times, but there's a no-sell here. The Giant hits Hogan, knocks him to the ground. Hulk hulks up there, goes back to those sort of red and yellow ways, even though he's in the black there. Um, and he looks like he's going to attack the giant. The whole Dungeon of Doom come to ringside and get involved. Savage comes in as well. The baby faces manage uh, to actually get everyone out of the ring, which seems to be uh, quite interesting as well. Um, I mean, it's just so much going on here in such a quick time. Like you could argue, it's all a bit rushed here, you might feel. But um, we get to the point where Hogan and Savage are left in the ring. The lights are flickering. Um, and uh, here we go. We're, we're going to give it to you now. Uh, the lights flickering. Eric Bischoff saying, like, you know, what's happening? What's happening? The floor is shaking. The iceberg cracks. And here comes this mummy-dressed <laughs> yeti out of the iceberg in another probably top moment of wrestle crap in history uh, as uh, Nitro goes off the air. It happens so quickly with the Yeti that if you blink, you missed it. Um, so much in such a short time, so much to dissect. George, give us your thoughts on this and we'll start with uh, the attack afterwards here on uh, Luger and Sting. I really like that. I think the fact you're creating these seeds about Luger again to where you can trust him, you're making the Dungeon of Doom look a million dollars again, which, which was good. Um, the fact you get Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage come out, that makes sense. They're key, they're key components of Halloween Havoc. Um, what I didn't really like about it, I felt that Hulk Hogan's basically made, how he made the Giant look like he was vulnerable going into the pay view, I felt was a bit of a mistake. I think they should have kept the Giant strong the way they built him previously. Um, but this was all right. I really don't know why they gave away the Yeti on Nitro. It seems to me it's almost like the gobbledygooker. You would have thought they would save that kind of big reveal, the shocking reveal of the Yeti to the Halloween Havoc show. But... Um, yeah, by the by the time the Halloween by the time sort of the uh, Yeti came out, I think I was just like, "What the hell's going on?" I felt um, this was crazy. I just felt this was really, really wrestle crap, and um, this almost looked like something a five year old would watch. I just felt it was um, really comedic, and, and this isn't a way to set a pay per view. You're ultimately going into sort of Halloween habit, yet your payoff for the angle at the moment is a Yeti coming out, as if that's going to buy it and get you any extra ratings or buyers, shall we say, not ratings. Absolutely. No, I agree. And it got to a point where this was just too messy for me. Uh, too much to, to capture in, in such a quick time. I didn't like the fact that the Dungeon of Doom, like you say, that they looked a bit vulnerable. I mean, Hogan and Savage took out about five guys, um, which is not good. Um, and yeah, with, with this, this, this Yeti, I mean, yeah. I mean, you mentioned the Gobbledygooker. Had they not learned anything from that, from Survivor Series 1990? It was awful back then in 1990. I remember as a kid watching the Survivor Series 1990 and hating the Gobbledygooker. So, uh, yeah, the Yeti, not so much. But definitely you, you couldn't help but have a little laugh at the same time because, like you say, it's pure WrestleCrap 101. Um, yeah, it doesn't do much for the pay-per-view, my personal opinion. But I suppose you could say Halloween Havoc is a Halloween-themed pay-per-view and having this mummy come out here, this iceberg thing, I suppose it fits the theme if we have to try and find something positive for it. Um, for me, the episode ends on a bit of a sour note, but I do think, again, another strong Nitro at this point. If it was Nitro, really is finding its feet and um, uh, it certainly knows how to put on an, it's certainly an exciting product, something a lot to talk about uh, because, I mean, like we say, these are these are... A short shows and uh, we find a lot to dissect from it 
Yeah, I, th- I think my overall rating of the show was I felt this was one of the weakest ones I've done so far. Um, I didn't mind parts of it. I think sort of the, the problem I have with it ultimately is, as you said earlier, they, they didn't do anything with Let's Luger and Randy Savage properly. And you got that match to come. Uh, and then you, also there's so many other matches that are going to happen at Halloween Havoc. They didn't use this show to kind of promote. And I think the one my one main complaint was they didn't build anything for next week, which was really surprising because Nitro had been doing that regularly at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, they normally had a match, sort of something set for the following week. They didn't hear. I suppose you had to tune into the pay-per-view to get the, the buzz for, for Nitro uh, of what would come from there. But um, yeah, I, I do agree with you to a, to a certain extent. Uh, for me, I found the show entertaining. Maybe some reasons were for the wrong reasons, but um, you know, it, it certainly um, had a lot going on here. I enjoyed the work they'd done uh, up until the main event segment of building up the Giant and, and Hogan um, because at this point this match is obviously the main match and they've really built it as something very special a lot of time had gone into it like you said there was no mention there of, of the Luger and Savage stuff unfortunately but um, I, I mean I enjoyed the tag team match as well with, with the with the Cruiserweights I thought that was very good as well um, there's definitely a lot to talk about and I think sometimes that that's very interesting indeed because uh, we can look at sort of the three hour Raws and not to dig on today's product because we're certainly not going to dig it in this sort of time scale what we're going through at the moment but sometimes you can talk about Raw a three hour Raw in the same time length that we've talked about uh, you know one Nitro in 45 minutes so I think that that goes to say that uh, they're, they're definitely doing something to keep eyes on the product and certainly uh, trying to to get your attention, which I think is what they're, they're definitely doing here at this point. Definitely. How are they doing the ratings with this one? So interesting one. So since this was coming off of uh, sort of a WF pay-per-view, the previous night was in your house, WF got the bigger rating. WF drew a 2.6 rating for this show. Nitro only got a 2.2. Uh, the main event for WF at that point was Shawn Michaels versus Owen Hart. And this was the match where Shawn Michaels fainted from an insecurity, if I remember correctly. Um, so um, it's interesting just the fact that Shawn Michaels and Owen Hart, that must have been a far techni- far greater technical match. Um, but what, what do you make of that, that they got the higher rating again? No surprise. Like you said, the pay-per-view bump. Uh, Shawn and Owen, for me, uh, you know you're getting a great match between those two. Um, and... I mean, if, if my memory serves me correctly, that that was an absolute masterclass of, of a match as well to watch. I do think you would be more interested in seeing Brett, uh, sorry, not Brett, Sean and Owen uh, over Harlem Heat, uh, no disrespect to them at this point uh, in a main event segment. That would be what would have my attention. Um, you can argue, yeah, I mean, W7 has perhaps some of the bigger main event names when you look at Hogan, Savage, Sting, Luger, Ric Flair. You've got the Giant in there as well. But I mean, if you've got... Uh, the matches where you've got your bigger talent against each other. I think that's when you tend to know that uh, there'll be more of an interest. I mean, a lot of the big talent in WCW are there, but they're taking on weaker members of the roster. So it is kind of a foregone conclusion at this point of most of the matches, who is going to win before going in. I don't turn around and say, oh, we're shocked where Kurosawa picked up a victory over Randy Savage. We know going in that Savage is going to pick up the W. Yeah, definitely. I think um, what will be interesting to see is when we do the next Nitro, whether um, WCW get the pay-per-view lift, as well it will, be, it will be interesting one thing we have to say in strength for wcw here is you mentioned those two ratings and it looks like wcw maintains their rating which is good they're, they're not far off and they didn't really lose any ground off of the uh the pay-per-view so although they that uh wwf or wwe if you want uh, at that point did obviously continue the momentum because they had the pay-per-view the night before um certainly no momentum was lost from wcw at this stage it seemed that the fans that got in this monday night war they were keeping uh, around which uh, certainly is a positive at this stage yeah definitely certainly indeed um would you want to touch on halloween havoc today or do you want to keep it separate as a, as a full-on episode Let's, uh, we'll have a brief discussion. Um, if anybody does want us to do a longer, just please put some likes or put some comments down and we will obviously explore it longer. But um, we can go over Halloween Havoc, uh, just some, some of the key parts that pay off what we've just discussed, really. So um, from Halloween Havoc, what, what was quite interesting was the fact that you had um, Lex Luger defeated Min by disqualification, which is Lex Luger once again trying to get some sort of momentum back. I'm surprised it wasn't a clean victory, but that was a very quick match. Yeah, it was a quick match from my memory, yeah. Yeah, very quick match. We also have Randy Savage beating Zodiac, not Kamala. Um, the, the story behind that one was that Kamala was uh, decided to walk out instead of lose to Randy Savage. What do you make of that? Uh, very interesting, because uh, to be honest, they, they had no altercations leading up to the to the pay-per-view I was so I mean that, that I'd seen on Nitro at least and um, for me I, I felt that this was a, a very random combination of superstars to put together anyway 
Um, Kamala, for me at this stage, there was no investment. He felt like the weakest member of the Dungeon of the Doom for me. I know that Zodiac probably was the weakest member and Shark as well, but um, Zodiac filled the role perfectly. I think Zodiac's kind of got a better look for the Dungeon of the Doom as well. I like the, what they've done with the face paint and the and the hair and stuff like that. Um, but Savage got a very quick victory as well in this one. It sort of um, built up that we knew we were getting Savage and Luger. And I think it was a foregone conclusion before the pay-per-view started that uh, if you didn't get that match later in the card, that was going to be very disappointing. Yeah, definitely. And, and also, we we then got uh, Stin and Ric Flair facing Brian Pillman and Arn Anderson. I love this match. This match obviously went on quite a bit of time, but what I really loved about it was the, was the finish. Ultimately, you've got a uh, sort of... Rip Flair sort of been been out of most of the match and then teasing the tag continually. Stin finally does tag Rick Flair in and then Rick Flair takes him out. And the reaction from the crowd, they're just ghostly silent. It was almost that was what you call a perfect heel turn, in my opinion. Absolutely. We just we just can support we just believe Rick Flair. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Rick Flair was attacked before the tag team yeah. match, or supposedly. Yeah. Uh, he come uh, he was in his normal trousers and he had like uh, you know, something covering his head where yeah. apparently he'd been bleeding earlier in the evening. Um and it was done to perfection because Sting was a, it was a two on one situation. It seemed believable that Sting would start the match two on one as well because of what had happened. Ric Flair coming down to make the save gets the tag in immediately just turns on Sting and it absolutely ruins Sting. Um, like you say, it was good length of time given for the match. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I thought it was it was really well done. Uh, and we see here that the, the Horsemen are back together with three members. We've got Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, and Brian Pillman. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's an exciting trio. Yeah, definitely. And we also then got the the one everyone's waiting for, the monster truck match, Hulk Hogan and Giant. This was um, absolute wrestle crap again. This was uh, just pure comedy. Um, I think the only real highlight of that was the fact that Hulk Hogan won. He then supposedly threw the Giant off the roof of the building, which was a bit morbid. I think um, the way that WWT and the Giant actually died, I think was a bit over the top. Um, what were your thoughts of the Giant going over the building? Unnecessary. Unneeded. Um didn't do anything for me. I mean, if anything, you kind of think you can't suspend your disbelief that I think that's probably the best way to go with that. Really. Um, it's hard to believe anything. The monster truck went on for too long. Uh, was, I found it particularly boring. Uh, if I'm being brutally honest, um, this, this was, uh, this was quite a painful segment. We could have done without it. Just needed the match. I understand why they've done the monster trucks. I mean, it's the Motor City they're in. It's Detroit. Um, probably part of what they've, they've come up with this idea to begin with. But um, yeah, I could have done without all this. I think there was something we went for this match. Just the fact to try and get new fans interested in the brand to some point. But um, yeah, the fact that you're getting the giant going over and the way the commentators and Hogan are making like he's dead. It was a bit over the top for me. But um, we then move on. We then had Randy Savage beat Lex Luger, um, which was... Um, Interesting to see Randy Savage get that payoff. Big win for Randy Savage against Lex Luger. You are bearing Lex Luger here regularly. Um, we, what was your thoughts of that match? I felt that this match was too short. And I understand that uh, these two had wrestled earlier in the evening, but they had fairly short matches. I thought that they had short matches because they were going to get maybe a 15-minute match later in the evening. And, and the match, I believe, was only about seven minutes long, if I'm not mistaken. I, I remember timing it at the time of watching. Um, and I think yeah. it was around the seven minute mark. And uh, yeah, I was surprised. Um, I kind of felt Luke would probably come out on top if I was being brutally honest, because he was the new acquisition. But um, Savage was was the guy that uh, they put over. They clearly uh, want to continue building Randy Savage at this point. And why wouldn't you? He's one of the big names in WCW. Um, and for me, the, what I got the feeling of with this was that it was a quick match. Um, I don't feel it did Luger any favours um, and I felt that if this was the payoff and this was the last time that it was a bit disappointing if I was being honest. Definitely. I think the fact that uh, they're really burying Lex Luger um, throughout his WWE run so far, which is a shame really, but um, this, did, this did kind of did what it needed to do in the semi-final position. We then go on to the one that we've been waiting for for a month, the Giant versus Hulk Hogan. Um, this match was okay. It was messy in parts. Um we get a couple of key things. We get Hulk Hogan looks like he's going to get the win. Uh, and then Jimmy Hart seems to pull out the referee. And the, the camera doesn't actually catch that, which is surprising. Uh, yeah. What were your thoughts of the camera missing that vital spot at that point? Uh, it's almost, if we want to compare it, it's almost like this year's Royal Rumble with Edge returning and missing the first spear on Dolph Ziggler. Uh, you've waited for it for so for something to happen so important, and uh, then then it misses the key moment. Uh, it, it wasn't the best uh, that, that that it misses that moment, but um, I do think they they managed to recover the segment as best as they can. Yeah, definitely. And we then got uh, sort of Jimmy Hart and Hulk Hogan. Uh, sort of Hulk Hogan looks like he's aligned with Jimmy Hart. He turns his back and Jimmy Hart takes Hogan out. 
And then what then happens is the uh, Dungeon of Doom run out, as always, and obviously Hulk Hogan's outnumbered. You then get the Yeti coming out and to sort of fandom. Yeti and Giant sort of almost team up on Hulk Hogan. You then get Randy Savage coming out for the save. Randy Savage and Lex Luger both come out of line, which was strange. Next thing you know, you've got Randy Savage being attacked. Lex Luger joins in the attacking, thus joining the Dungeon of Doom. You're finally paying off a whole month's worth of build there, which is a big shock. What, what were your thoughts of that big payoff there at that point? Jimmy Hart turning and Lex Luger also turning. Big smile. Um, I remember Savage saying that uh, to keep an eye on uh, Sting, Luger and Jimmy Hart, and he expected all of them to be a part of the Dungeon of Doom. And uh, he definitely got two out of three right. And uh, that was that was definitely an interesting pay, payoff for uh, the storyline uh, for, for Savage warning us. Because at that point, we were questioning Savage as well because of uh, Savage was definitely losing his temper a hell of a lot. Um, and yeah, for me, the, the whole segment, um, the Dungeon of the Doom for me come out with more credibility, it come out a lot stronger. Um, and you really felt at this point that, um, that this, this now looked like a proper stable going forward because they had a lot of the comedy characters that, that didn't seem believable, uh, to, to be, you know, able to become a world champion or defeat Hogan. The giant was the one that kind of brought them up that high level to begin with. And now they've got Jimmy Hart in there, which is obviously the, the arguably the, the biggest manager in WCW. You've got Luger, perhaps, uh, you know, that big signing, even though he perhaps hadn't won a lot of his matches, he certainly was uh, a spearhead of, of one of those top, top competitors in there. And he'd been wrestling a lot of the big stars as well. It wasn't as if he was losing to jobbers. So, um, yeah, I mean, this, this stable looks a lot stronger at this point. Definitely. This this was very much a WWE Attitude-esque, Vince Russo-type angle. The fact that you're getting all these swerves across the show, it was really refreshing at that point. Um, ultimately, the Giant does beat Hulk Hogan, but it's by disqualification, so Hulk Hogan has kept the belt. Um, this was a really interesting pay-per-view for me. I think in ring it wasn't particularly great, but the amount of swerves you're getting here and the amount of build-up you're getting to these payoffs, you're getting two heel turns here. You've had Ric Flair, you've had Lex Luger as well, and you're also getting Jimmy Hart now as well. This clearly made, as you said, the Dungeon of Doom look a lot stronger, and you are clearly thinking Hulk Hogan's finished here. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the Giant leaves with the belt as well, if I'm not mistaken, uh, even though he's not actually declared as the new champion. So um, an interesting twist that uh, the Giant actually walks away with the belt um, at that point. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this this uh, the match itself as well was, was probably a little bit messy. I mean, I, I watched recently the Broken Skulls with the Big Show uh, with Steve Austin, and uh, I remember the Big Show actually saying that he was so green at this point that he had to be more or less directed what to do really at this point. This was his first match. Um, we have to all remember that, but um, certainly they, they had a direction of where they wanted to go with this and uh, they managed to, to pull it off. So, uh, yeah, even though perhaps it's not going to go down as one of the greatest all time classics, um, I think we have to appreciate uh, the talking points that come out of this. And I think that's the that's the strength of this pay-per-view. Not necessarily the match quality is, is amazing, but definitely the destination of everything that we're trying to accomplish and pull off. They got and they certainly got us where you wanted and needed to see what happened the next night on Nitro. 100%. Um, just before we leave that on, on Halloween, have a, I just want to quickly touch. Uh, Sabu had one of his last uh, appearances for the company uh, during that, didn't he, when he defeated JL. Um, and I believe he actually had uh, he had a, a manager. Did he have the Sheik with him as well yeah. uh, at that point? Uh, and as well, Johnny B. Bad, I believe he, he defeated uh, DDP as well, didn't he, uh, on that pay-per-view as well? Yeah, so Sabu's one of Sabu's last matches. Um, this was a really fantastic match. I didn't get much time. A couple of key highlights of it was the way that the original Sheik for a fireball at JL, that was different for WW at that point. It was pretty uh, East W esque. Um, I thought this was really good. I was surprised that they, um, considering they had Sabu on the way out, that they buried JL here following his win on Nitro the week before. That's a bit of a, a strange hint to me, but um, this match was good. Didn't get enough time. I, unfortunately, most of the match time went to the Let's Liga Min match. It went on far too long early, later on in the show. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of Johnny B. Bad and DDP, Johnny B. Bad is now your television champion. He's now won it. Um, they paid off the match. Just got a really good amount of time. And this was what a television title match should be. This was, um, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, really good indeed. A quick question just on Sabu, and uh, just before we close up, because obviously Sabu was a big part of the starting of our, our talk here, and we said that we knew he didn't have a long run here with WCW, which is probably why we can give him his closing chapter if you want here, because I don't think we're going to discuss him any further from this point. Um, was you surprised? Because he was, he was over. Uh, the crowd were, were buying into Sabu, but it just felt like that... Um, I, something wasn't connecting with, with either WCW management or Sabu's happiness. Um, what, what, what kind of went wrong? I think the problem you've got with Sabu, although he's fantastic in ring, he's never been great on a promo. 
and he didn't have anybody to connect to the audience that could get could get him over. If that makes sense, he really needed a Paul Heyman or somebody to speak for him to get him over. Um, and I really think the way that they cut his cut his like table shots and stuff when he was going through tables and stuff like that, they threw away the gimmick. The problem is he was only really sort of he only really wrestled with JL previously and stuff in WCW. It was just a shame really after the initial vignette he had on week one that they didn't stick with him and give him a run because he does go on some great stuff in ECW down the line. Absolutely. Of course, he returns back at the November to Remember, which is in November, obviously, for people who are keeping score, of uh, that 1995. So, I mean, it's clearly just a couple of weeks afterwards. So, um, yeah, it, it just goes to show that, um, yeah, it's a short run for Sabu in WCW at this point. But um, what could have been? I mean, he was he was definitely over. That was that was one thing for sure. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the Halloween Havoc show, I, I thought that was uh, overall... Uh, Interesting show and uh, leads now to the next pay-per-view. We start building towards World War Three, um, which will be from our next episode of our next two episodes of Monday Night Show. Are you, are you looking forward to, uh, to to watching those shows and uh, so we can review them for next week? I am, definitely. It should be interesting to see where they go. They've got so many questions I need to answer coming off this pay-per-view, so I'm really looking forward to watching Night Shows. Absolutely. Me too as well there. Uh, but uh, I think that's everything we've got covered for this week, George. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for all watching that. As always, it's good to have you guys watching here with the SCW Rewind. If you'd like us to do pay-per-views in a full episode in future, let us know in the comments below. Um, you can also let us know your thoughts of Night Show so far at this point, your your pros, your minuses. Um, and uh, yeah, you can always keep up to date each and every week as we continue to follow the world of WCW on SCW Rewind. If there's anything specifically you want us to cover as well, let us know. Um, we'll see if we can sort that out for you as well. Uh, we're doing the Money in the Bank is coming up as well um we can try and maybe sort something out with that as well if you'd be interested in it uh, just let us know in the comments always the best way to go keep an eye on the channel as well videos uploading all the time of course ask scw back this weekend uh, there's a previous episode that you can go and check out now as well uh, and as well we have done a video as well on the ww releases as well so go and check that out now uh, but that's all from us anyway thank you for watching please like share and subscribe um and uh, make sure as well to spread the word of scw of course it goes a long way in helping build us here in the wrestling community uh, but thank you for watching we'll see you next time here on youtube.com take care